so um, you've all come in here today because uh, you also would like to get better at doing something that's disruptive. Um, with me today, I've brought uh, Naveen from Foursquare, who uh, I think it's fairly recognized that they've managed to do something quite disruptive. They have reached that 10 million mark. And I also have Luke Williams, who's the author of the book uh, Disrupt. So I've got a couple of people with me that hopefully will shed a little bit of light on this quite complicated topic. Um, and the first thing I wanted to ask is, what is disruption? The thing is that it's one of these terms that we use all the time, which uh, sometimes is, is used but often misused, and it sounds really complicated, right? It sounds like something that, oh, this, this is probably something you should be trained in, and this is probably something that you know, is, is incredibly hard, and I don't know if it applies to my business because we're in this industry, or I've been doing this job for a long time. Or so some of the things that we wanted to touch on today is, how it is possible to do it. So hopefully that you guys can get some tools that you can use in your companies. What it is, of course, is that it's something radical. So it's innovation, but it's innovation that's taken one step further. Most innovations and most product developments are really just incremental. They're a slight improvement of what's happening already. The same way as uh, when we saw the first tablet, you know, suddenly within the next 18 months, we've seen like 50 tablets. Um, and of course, that's much easier than come out and do it, do the first one. But if you always keep in mind that it has to be radical and it has to be game changing, then we're starting to go over towards something that has the potential to be disruptive. Um, what are some of the companies that have done it quite well? Well, some of the ones that I like is a company like Airbnb, for example. Airbnb have totally changed the way that uh, the accommodation industry works. Ten years ago, that industry was disrupted by companies like Hotel.com, where you could go to one website and find all the hotels. Now it's not even hotels anymore. So every time that something gets too established and it works too well, then it also gets a little bit boring, and then someone comes in and shakes it up. Uh, it also happened with PayPal, for example. I'm sure that in the beginning it would have seen the ludicrous idea that, um, yeah, I'll just transfer my money into this unknown vault on the internet and then hopefully it will reach this person that I need to reach. But the thing is that PayPal works. And it works because it is radical and it's game changing. So these are all quite big uh, examples, which may seem like a little bit hard to take the first step towards. But there's also, some, um, there's also some disruptive stuff happening right here in Malmö. For example, one of my favorite projects at the moment is uh, Lars Lübergs, who's looking at bringing free Wi-Fi to the whole of Malmö. That's incredibly disruptive because it really changes behavior. If everyone can access the internet when they're waiting for the train or they're picking uh, which groceries they should get at the supermarket or instead of going from shop to shop, you can quickly go in and then research when you're in that bot. So it doesn't just change like one little thing. Of course, the primary thing it changes is that it becomes really sucky to be an internet provider in Melmö then. <laughs> and uh, they definitely had it coming. So personally, I'm quite happy for that because uh, the telcos will definitely not innovate unless someone kicks them in the butt. Um, there's also another company, Flatter, the company that, um, you can, that has these little stickers you all have on your badges here. They've done something quite radical and I like it because they're at the early stage. This isn't yet something that everyone uses every day. And therefore it's a great example of, of where you start. So the concept of you ca I can go in and give a little bit of a micro donation to someone whose work I've appreciated instead of paying 80 kroners for the whole magazine, for example, maybe I just want to read that article, but I would also like to give a little bit of love back to the person who's written that. That's totally disruptive because everyone knows that the content producing industry is dead, like the business model for it just doesn't work anymore. People do not want to pay for the stuff that they wanted to pay for five years ago. So little solutions like this have to come up to go in and fix that problem. Um, if that happens, you know, then I think then you have another company that Sweden can be really proud of and where you can go in and say that you are actually quite good at innovating because there is some, there is some quite radical stuff coming out of Sweden. And I think if you guys just keep on the same course. But what, of course, we have to be careful of as Scandinavians is that it's quite easy. I'm Danish. I'm not Swedish, but uh, it's a little bit the same. Uh, what we have to be really careful of here is that we don't get fat and lazy. 
because we live in a society where everything is given to us, you know. It's the government's responsibility that we can fund our startups, that we can get things working and that we can get uh, unemployment benefits. And all of these things do not induce um, productivity and creative thinking and stuff. It should because we have everything we need. We have all our bare necessities covered. But what often happens is that we just lean back and then wait for the rest of the country kind of to drag it. Um, but it's people like these guys, like you, that sit in this room that will be responsible for pulling the rest of the country, not the other way around. Because just by being at something like this, you're showing that you have those characteristics um, uh, and that level of ambition that means that it can happen from you. One thing that I, one quote that I really like is this from here from Henry Ford, where he said, "If I'd asked them what they wanted, they would have said faster horses." When we're building disruptive products, we're not building what the customers want. We are building what they don't know they want yet. And the Dropbox CEO um, also said that was their concept. Like they, when they first built Dropbox, no one had any idea that they had a problem saving files because they sit on my computer. And then it was only when people started having it shared through friends that people realized, oh, actually, I've just discovered a new problem, but luckily I discovered the solution at the same time. And that is necessary. It needs to be so radical if it has to be really disruptive. It also needs to be incredulous. I'm sure when they invented the telephone, people would have said, yeah, you've got to be fucking kidding me, as if I believe that you can speak into this little plastic thing and then I can hear my mother in Australia, like... Obviously, that's not, that's not true. Um, and I think it's like that with all disruptive products. It's, uh, I've got like an innovator's ambition test, which is something I've invented myself, so it's like purely unscientific. But generally, it means that when you have an idea and you go around asking people what they think about it, if everyone sees it as feasible and reasonable, then it's not ambitious enough. It's like the opposite of product testing, where we say, uh, ask your grandmother, and if she understands it, then the UX is good enough. This is like the grandmother, if she understands it, then you're being too conservative. So, uh, and I'm glad that grandmothers are getting a little bit more involved on the edge of technology, by the way, it's a nice trait. So, why is it so bloody hard? The reason that it's so bloody hard is that we are programmed to want people to like us, and we are programmed to want to fit in. And disruption, of course, means that you're doing stuff that sets you aside from the crowd. So all the way back from like tribal days, we're programmed to want to belong to the flock because if we were expelled from that group, then that would mean that, um, that, that we would die. We still use it today. If you do commit a crime against society, we put you in prison, so we separate you from your peers. If you do something bad in prison, we put you in isolation where we separate you even from your peers in there. That means that going out and doing something that is so brave that it is disruptive kind of goes against our nature. So I have, a, um, I have like a little bit of a test on myself. I'm a uh, tech entrepreneur and I'm also in the business of having to come up with stuff that's, that's disruptive and that's different. Um, and if I feel totally comfortable, then th there's something wrong, you know, then we're not risking it enough. I've got to be like a little bit on the edge of my seat and a little bit with my back to the wall and then I know that we're kind of out at a level where I want us to be. This, I quite like this little, to uh, this little slide here where it says, I used to be interested, interesting, then I discovered there's money in boredom. Or cheaper if they don't have to. Like the telco industry, again, is like a brilliant example. The big uh, monopolies only lower the prices when the small one comes in and forces them to. Um, so it is really up to people like us to go in and push those people. Also banks, like um, this is uh, Richard Branson's way of picking industries, and I love it. You know, he goes in and sees who deserves to get their ass kicked the most, and then he attacks them. And the more impossible it seems, the better. Like they went into banking in the beginning and bloody hell does the banking industry need to get a ass kick? Totally, you know? They've been taking fees for stuff that doesn't cost them anything for like 200 years. Surely that can be done better. And these are the questions that we need to ask ourselves all the time. 